Hey guys, in this vlog, I'm gonna answer a question about putting together your very first team of developers. So you have somebody who's got some experience coding, they had a few questions to me. So, should I use single or multiple programmers in every area of an app? Depends on the size and the scope of the app. What I can tell you is this, is that I have found in my experience that when you have more than three developers on a particular project, a particular part of the project, three is the optimum. Three is the optimum. When you have more than three, the productivity of the individual developers drops considerably. It's, uh, it's pretty dramatic. Why does it drop? Because you have a lot of overhead of coordinating the developers who are working together and whatnot. Now, if you have a good um, DevOps put into place, GitHub, good source control, et cetera, et cetera, this can alleviate a lot of the problems. But this is where object-oriented structure and using um, frameworks like an MVC framework like PHP Laravel or Django on Python, et cetera, et cetera. This is where these frameworks can allow you to separate uh, out the work amongst the developers. That's where the lead developer becomes very important because the lead developer sets the structure, sets the naming conventions uh, and all the other coding conventions. And then you can uh, parcel out or segment out the work to individual developers so they don't step on each other's t toes. Again, he asks, how big should the team be? From my experience, three is optimal, although with really good DevOps, you can maybe increase that a bit. And also the nature of the project, depends on the nature of the project. He asks, should I protect myself with a contract before I tell people my ideas? So that's called an, um, a non-competition agreement, NDA, non-disclosure agreement to a certain extent, but I think most developers are not gonna run out and try and rip you off uh, if you are an entrepreneurial developer. But you could have them sign that, and typically when I talk to new developers, and if they're gonna be exposed to some, do some internal black magic of a new app that I'm conceiving of or developing, then I might have them sign an NDA before I start revealing things. But at the end of the day, when you start releasing your product to the world, the idea is going to get out there. And uh, so it's not terribly important. From my experience, I don't find developers rip you off. It, ha it happens once in a while where they see an idea and they, they reproduce the idea, but whether they see it as one of your developers or they run across the idea when you release your app as a beta or, or even when you do full release, somebody's going to copy you if it's good. You have to expect that. He says, I want to learn Swift and also be used in this area of the project. So, it's, of course, he wants to do mobile apps, so he's asking me, should I learn Swift? Well, if you need Swift, if you need that speed, Swift is a great language, but unless you're just targeting iOS, then, uh, yeah, if you're just targeting iOS rather than just use Swift, because it's great, but if you ever want, if you think you're going to be addressing Android, then you might want to see whether or not um, the web stack using a hybrid app might be good enough for your project or maybe something like a Flutter or something, simply because you're a small startup, you don't have a huge amount of resources, and maybe just getting your version one out the door conceptually, maybe your app will, will be able to be built properly just using hybrid apps. Typically, you need to go you need to go native Swift for iOS or Andro or Java Kotlin for Android. You only need to go native if you have real high performance app apps that require a lot of juice like games or something. And that's pretty much it. So to reiterate, when you're setting up a team of developers for your project, I have found from my experience going back to the 90s that three developers on a particular project is optimal. Now this could be a particular project within the context of a very large piece of software. Uh, you just you want to try as much as possible to not have, to have too many people working on the same particular classes, if it's object-oriented, same particular objects or same particular modules if you're doing Python or something. It, it prevents or reduces the chance that you're going to have uh, people stepping on each other's toes. But again, that's where DevOps comes in, you use a GitHub or something, make sure people are checking in the code properly, and you as the head of the project should be managing the, uh, should be setting the standards rather, in terms of the coding standards, the framework standards, so that, again, this organizes this. 
this organizes the workflow. Workflow is such an important part of being in business. So I figure I'll end off this video with a little psychological technique, if you will. Now, some of you may or may not know, my, my major in university was psychology, and I still keep up to date with behavioral psychology, the latest stuff. And in the real world, whether it be uh, as a developer, whether it be as an entrepreneur, whether it be as a freelancer, whether it is dating, it's good to understand how your brain works, how your mind works. So here's one tip. I'm not going to get into all these different things. It's a big, it's a big area, but here's one tip. Now, when you feel uh, very emotional about a position, let's say I say Swift could be under a lot of pressure because of hybrid apps, and that gets you emotionally. You ought to see that emotion, that rise of the emotion, as an indicator of maybe, not always, but maybe that your, cloud, your judgment is cloudy. Happens to everybody. And why is that the case? Because when the emotions kick in, that means the lower brain, the lizard brain, is taking over. And the lower brain, the lizard, lizard brain, has no capacity for logical thinking. It, two plus two is beyond the capacity of the lizard brain. It's literally genetically not capable of it to do that. So let me back up. There's two basic parts of the brain. And this is like, I'm looking at this from a very high level, very, um, you know, it's very, what's the word I'm looking for? A very reader's digest point of view. This is a high level, simplified, very oversimplified representation of this but so just bear with me so you got the lizard brain which is the non-logical brain very powerful the emotional part of yourself then you got the logical brain which is the thinking brain the pain, the brain that we're conscious of the problem with the lizard brain it's very powerful much more powerful than our thinking brain and it works on emotion and it makes its judgments based on association so and sometimes these associations are not accurate Sometimes they are, a lot of times they are, but sometimes they're not. So whenever you feel an emotional response to a piece of information that you hear, or an opinion that you hear, take a step back, try to calm down the emotion, calm down your lizard brain, and see whether or not maybe, maybe the lizard brain might be clouding your judgment. It's not always the case, but sometimes it is. So this is something I learned actually originally in martial arts something I learned originally in martial arts and a lot in boxing where one of our tactics, one of the tactics, tactics of re ring fighting is you want to evoke emotion out of your opponent. You want to get them emotional. You want to get them angry, you want to get them scared, you want to get them anxious because when people are emotional their ability to fight will diminish oftentimes. They'll get less capable and they'll be more vulnerable to making mistakes. So that was one of the things we tried to do, is try to get people emotion, emotional. Uh, I remember once time I was sparring and my coach was a very high level fighter and uh, we were mi mixing up really hard and typically I w if I, they got a good shot on me, I would get annoyed by that and I want to get them back. And I remember when uh, my coach, he broke my nose uh, in sparring for a second, it was actually a second time in a year that he broke my nose because uh, I made a mistake. And I remember I was in the sparring and I remember I, I was bobbing and weaving and as I bobbed and weaved, I dropped my hand, my hand came down and I said, oh no. And I saw that punch coming. And I was like, and it's all in slow motion. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. And I could see that punch coming, coming and I knew I made a mistake by dropping my hand. See, if you go like this, that's stupid. You gotta go like this. Anyway, so I get hit, bang. But I had reached a level where I didn't react emotionally. I just stayed calm and just kept going, boom, 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 even though I'm bleeding. And my coach, after the, the sparring match, my coach said, that's it, you made a huge breakthrough because I was able to stay calm where normally I would get pretty pissed off when that type of blow would, you know, I get, when that would happen to me. So, and again, the whole point of the breakthrough was that by staying calm, I kept my game higher and, uh, same thing in all aspects of life. If you're a software developer or in business, in dating, try to control that, those emotional responses. A lot of times it could be accurate, but sometimes it could be inaccurate. But at the end of the day, uncontrolled emotional response, acting on emotion and not thinking can get you into a lot of trouble. So uh, count to 10, as they say, you know, and try to let the emotion subside before you say 
or do anything before you make a decision that you might regret. It's a good business tip. It's a good life tip. It's a good software development tip. Trust me, because uh, every time I react out of emotion, I usually, I usually get uh, I usually get in trouble with that. All right, ciao ciao.